Hey guys, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis. And in this video, we're going to cover some aspects of Remnant from the Ashes. We'll discuss some tips, strategies, and secrets for new and advanced players alike. Or, if you don't own Remnant and it sounds interesting to you, there's a link in the description box that will take you to all things Remnant from the Ashes. Beyond that though, I'll try to keep the topics as spoiler free as possible, but really the only thing that's not on the table for discussion is the last boss of the game. So if that bothers you, you've been warned. Alright, so let's jump right into it. Here's 12 advanced tips and secrets for Remnant from the Ashes. Let's start with class selection very briefly. And to me, of the three starting classes of Hunter, Ex-Cultus, and Scrapper, the Ex-Cultus is really the only way to go. This is because everything the classes start with, from weapons, armor, and mods, it's all purchasable at Riggs and McCabe. Meaning the only thing that really differentiates one class to the next is the starting trait. And to me, the most useful of the bunch is definitely Spirit with the Ex-Cultist. Alright, moving right along, we're going to cover some aspects that are somewhat hidden, but very useful right from the onset of the game. And that's how to obtain one of the most important traits, and how to find some early armor and the SMG, which is a gun I literally use from the start of the game, to the finish, and then for the next four playthroughs. In other words, the SMG is beast. Alright, first and foremost, right after leaving Ward 13, in Founder Ford's research room, the first thing to grab here is the key card, and we'll need that in a moment to get to the SMG. For now though, against the wall here is a bookshelf. Once broken, it reveals an opening in the wall. This will lead to the Drifter armor chest and leggings. And the Drifter armor set bonus is going to help with all the running we're about to do. Alright, now that we have the armor, head back to Ward 13. Just past Ace and Reggie is an entrance to the lower section of the ward. Once reaching level B2 of the ward, use the key card to open the locked door. After that, we're about to grab that important trade I mentioned, Elder Knowledge. This is unlocked by listening to the tape recorder found on the desk in the second room on the left. Alright, now that we have that, just head down the hallway to the next room on the left. In the corner near some medical equipment, grab this fuse. After grabbing the fuse, head back outside of B2 and down to level B3 of the ward. Once here, insert the fuse. Turn on the power, and then use the key card to open the doors. Upon entering this room, you'll see a large ventilation fan. Well, if you head back to the fuse box, turn off the power once more, the ventilation fan will shut down once again. Now that the power shut down on the fan, you can go past it to find a secret room. And here is where you'll find the Ward 13 Master Key. Just grab the key and head back up to level B2. Once you reach the locked door at the dead end, use the key to open the last door. And then, the SMG is yours. So right after the tutorial, and before you even really venture out into hostile territory, you have the Drifter Armor, the SMG, and you've also unlocked the Elder Knowledge trait. Which brings us to our next topic, recommendations for the best starting traits to put points into. And my first suggestion on which trait to fill is definitely Elder Knowledge, giving plus 35% additional XP. This will make you unlock more trait points way quicker. The 35% bonus might not sound like much, but it is quite a bit, especially if you happen to find the Sage Stone Ring giving another 15% XP for a total of 50% more XP. Trust me, not having Elder Knowledge right away is not overly noticeable on your first playthrough, but after two or three playthroughs in a game based around multiple playthroughs, its absence becomes more and more noticeable. You're gonna wanna max this trade out as early as possible. Next, I would highly suggest expanding your health pool by dumping points into Vigor. And if you chose the Ex-Cultist like I suggested, then points into Spirit is the next best option to help generate mod energy faster to use abilities more often. Now if you're worried about spending your trait points incorrectly, don't. Eventually you can reallocate all your character's trait points. Respecking unlocks at the end of the game from beating the last boss and receiving the terribly named Orb of Undoing. After unlocking the item, Reggie, the consumable merchant in Ward 13, sells them undoer orbs for 2,500 scraps permanently. 
Now there is a way to get around this though. You can respec if you have a co-op partner who has already unlocked Orbs of Undoing. This is because Remnant has a trading system, kinda. At least for crafting materials and consumables. Basically, the long and short of it is, if you're in a multiplayer game and one person sells something to the merchant, that sold item will then appear in the merchant's inventory for other players to buy for any players sharing the same world. So, your buddy need a few Luminite and you have some extra? You can help them out. Have a few extra orbs of undoing and someone wants to change their traits for a new build? Well, you can do that. Of course though, you sell these items at a loss and they still pay full price, but hey, it's something. Now since our friends are helping so much, here's a tip. Kill your friends! Not only is this sort of a fun little PvP dueling system with friendly fire, but getting killed will eventually unlock a special hidden trait after 10 takedowns, which reduces friendly fire damage. Suspicion is pretty useless in lower difficulties, but it becomes much more useful in the higher difficulties where friendly fire becomes much more severe. Also, it should be noted though, to unlock this, I think kills only contribute towards whomever is the host of the game, and no one else. Alright, the next one also has to do with unlocking a trait that's easily missed, even after multiple playthroughs. This is because, more often than not, most people find a gun they enjoy and tend to stick through it throughout the game, and in subsequent playthroughs, tend to stick to their favorite weapons and don't change them. No fault there, but to unlock Sleight of Hand, you have to kill 100 enemies with 10 different weapons. In other words, you're gonna need to change weapons. So my tip and secret here, besides the obscure means of unlocking the trait, is to try your best to unlock sleight of hands as soon as you obtain 10 weapons. This will prevent you from making the same mistake that I did, which was basically getting a full set of armor and a few weapons to level 20, making the zone spawn higher level enemies in the process. Meaning, in order to kill 100 enemies with 10 weapons, I needed to waste a ton of high level materials to level up a lot of weapons. Do yourself a favor, save yourself the trouble, unlock this trait sooner rather than later. Now to that end, it should be noted that just like unlocking suspicion, only a host gains progress towards unlocking sleight of hand. Also, just as a tip to ease the process of your 100 kills for each weapon, a very good method of farming is to locate an earth dungeon with a lot of seed minions. These dungeons are pretty easy to find and they're loaded with a bunch of these little dudes. Once you find the dungeon with seed minions, just do a few runs per weapon and you'll unlock the trait pretty quickly. I found that I got about 60 kills per run and they each took about mm, 4 to 5 minutes. Alright, since we're on the topic of maxed out gear and not wasting your materials on a bunch of stuff that you're not very interested in, for the next one I just want to briefly cover a very rare material, because the way it works is something that I wish I knew from the start of the game. And that material is simulacrum. Essentially this material has two uses. It's needed as a crafting material for weapons and armor to reach their maximum level of plus 20 for normal items and plus 10 for boss items. Or, it's also required to trade into the Root Mother for additional Dragonheart charges. So that's it, maxing out equipment and gaining Dragonheart charges. More importantly though, what you need to understand is the rarity of this item. In short, basically each biome of Earth, Rom, Corsus, and Yesha will only have one simulacrum somewhere on the map. Supposedly A sells one at some point once per playthrough during the late game, but I've never seen it. Meaning more than likely you only have the opportunity to find four simulacrum per playthrough, and one of those four is required to upgrade each Dragonheart charge, each armor piece, and each weapon to max level. Its rarity and your use of it is just something to consider. You don't want to waste them. Next, let's take a moment to discuss some of the special aspects of the neutral dodge, basically the unsung hero of personal defense and remnant. Now, in the same way the directional dodge has iframes, which is a short window at the beginning of a dodge animation wherein an attack that would normally damage the player instead passes right through the character, the neutral dodge has the same thing, only better. Essentially, what you may not know is that the neutral dodge, which is performed by pressing dodge without a direction, is much faster than the directional dodge. And by faster, I mean the animation is much shorter with less recovery time, allowing you to perform other actions like shooting, attacking with melee, consume an item, dodging again, basically whatever you need when milliseconds and reaction time matter most. 
Also, unlike the normal directional dodge, which is affected by the weight of your armor, causing you to almost look like you're rolling through soup at higher weight loads, the neutral dodge animation instead is the same speed regardless of wearing light, medium, or heavy armor. And last but not least, if performed while aiming down sights, the neutral dodge can be executed even faster to animation cancel. This aim down sight method can be done back to back to back. Like I said, crazy good. Another thing you may not know, which also applies to dodging, is that while your character is on fire, you can perform a dodge to take a large chunk out of the remaining burning duration per roll. But even though you're not rolling, this still applies to the neutral dodge. Now apply that with the neutral dodge's speed, just one more reason why the neutral dodge is a powerhouse of defense and remnant. Now speaking of powerhouses, the next topic is just a quick tip and mechanic for defeating Ixalus the world guardian and final boss of Corsus, often considered the most difficult encounter in the game to newcomers. This perceived challenge is due to the fact that once Ixalus has been lowered to 75% total health, another Ixalus joins the fight, causing an assault from two different directions simultaneously. I've seen a lot of people struggle with this fight, and more often than not, they never take their initial focus off the first Ixalus at the start of the fight. Well, what you may not know is, before dropping the first Ixalus by 25% HP, there's actually a hive in the back of the room. If the hive is destroyed before the creature bursts from within, the Ixalus inside the hive will join the fight with a quarter of its health depleted. And, well, that's about it. I hope that quick tip and hidden mechanic helps you defeat Ixalus with a little bit more ease. Now, speaking of killing Ixalus, the next topic covers one of the biggest choices in Remnant, and that choice is the decision of whom to gift the Guardian Heart to after defeating Ixalus. The Guardian Heart can be given to the Iskal Queen or the Undying King. Long story short, though, I'm just going to put on screen what you get for each trade-in. Well, technically, you only get about half of this solely from the Queen, but in siding with the Queen, you will be forced to kill the Undying King, which results in the rest of the items. Point being, if you're up for the challenge of taking down the Undying King, I highly suggest giving the Guardian Heart to the Iskal Queen, at least on your first playthrough. Alright guys, that's about it from me. Let me know if you have any questions about Remnant from the Ashes in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer everything I can. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. It goes a long way with the success and searchability of videos. It helped me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Perfect World for sponsoring this video. And like I said at the start, if you're interested in the game, there's a link in the description box that will take you to all things Remnant from the Ashes. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.